morning, everybody, and welcome to our next webinar around sustainability. Now, as you know, we've launched a next series of six webinars, and we're going to talk about the greenhouse gas protocol over the next six months. And in December, we'll finish off with decarbonisation strategies. Um, today, I'm joined for the first time by Dylan Byrne, who's been um, a partner at BDO for an awful long time. Um, and Dylan has recently relocated from Brisbane to Melbourne. And as a welcome gift, we've invited him to present on a webinar. So Dylan, welcome to the webinar series. Um, and we hope you enjoy the experience, and not just in Melbourne, but also on the online webinars. Oh, thanks for um, having us. Um, then I, I would like, and, and we, Dylan and I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay our respect to elders past, present and emerging. Um, and in Melbourne, our office, um, we meet on the place of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And we obviously pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I know our attendees could be meeting various other places. Um, and we extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples um, that's joined us today. Um, just to highlight, as you know, we've been running these sustainability webinars over the last 18 months, and we've just launched the topics for the next six months. And you can see here, it's all about the greenhouse gas protocol. And very soon you'll understand why, because there's a lot of movement around carbon accounting, measuring your carbon footprint. So today we're really setting the scene, and then we'll work through how do you measure scope one, scope two, scope three over two months, and finally decarbonisation strategies in December, when we'll be joined by one of our Brisbane partners, Brett Spicer, uh, to talk about that. Um, I also want to flag that we've got our long running um, IFRS and corporate reporting webinar series. And for the first number of webinars this month, we've actually looked at sustainability topics. Um, and um, earlier this month, we've um, reverted back to more accounting IFRS topics, looking at lease accounting, next month convertible notes, et cetera. Um, so um, everybody's now busy with 30 June financial statements. So we go back to normal IFRS topics, but there's this big link between what we put in our annual financial statements, what we put um, in the OFR around sustainability information. Um, therefore, you're welcome to also join at those webinars. Dylan, I'll hand over to you to talk about today's agenda. Thank you, and uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, so today's agenda, we're going to um, give you all a bit of an update on uh, some big uh, changes and announcements that came through in June, which are very important in this sustainability journey. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about June 2023 reporting, uh, but the main topic of today is talking about carbon footprint. And we really want to, I guess, work through the whole greenhouse gas protocol, which is the, the preeminent um, guidance that we refer to. And, and in, that, in that process, we're going to be looking at not only the reporting principles, but also how do you determine your inventory boundary? There's some very specific rules and, and guidance around that. Flying through to how to set your organisational boundary, which is a very complex area and something that we're getting a lot of intention and questions on. So we'll give you some good guidance on that. And finally, we wanna look at the operational boundary, which is more around the emissions themselves. Thank you, back to you. Thank you, Dylan. I think I've neglected to say, Dylan, that you are really the expert on the greenhouse gap, gas protocol at BDO. Um, Dylan has been assisting with carbon audits under the ENGA Act for many, many years. And so I think what we're trying to bring to the webinar today is Dylan's experience around carbon accounting, carbon audits, and maybe fusing it with the financial reporting and accounting mm. general principles. And because the two go hand in hand, um, and I often say at a conceptual level, it's important to understand that whatever we do from a reporting side and a reporting entity perspective, should be mirrored by what we do on a carbon accounting perspective. We're talking ultimately about the same entity. Um, and yeah. therefore, it's, it's a good way to stress test whether you're on the right path. Um, so really, thank you for joining uh, Dylan and for 
uh, tackling the, the series with me as we really try to discover how this worked together and, and how would be an easy way for our clients to, to implement this. Yep. Um, I would like to start, and I know it's somewhat off topic, it's not about the greenhouse gas protocol, um, but the last week of June 2023 was a really big week for sustainability reporting globally, but also in Australia. So what happened globally is on Monday, the 26th of June, the International Sustainability Standards Board issued their first two standards. So IFRS S1 and S2. S1 looking at general disclosures for sustainability related financial information and S2 looking at climate related disclosures. Now, the ISSB was established at COP21, November 2021. Um, and within 18 months, the fastest ever standard setting I've seen, um, they've published the first two standards. So it's a real uh, a big moment for us. And then the other thing I should add is this morning when I woke up, I saw that IOSCO, which is the International Organization of Securities Commissions and ASIC in Australia is a member of IOSCO. IOSCO has overnight um, um, supported and endorsed IFRS S1 and S2. And again, that's a very significant step. That's a, the international securities regulators. And remember, that would be in the US, Europe, UK, Asia, Australia. All of them have endorsed IFRS S1, S2. Um, a really big step because we know there was always talk about we don't have a generally accepted framework globally. Um, and that endorsement really um, puts acceptance into these standards. Um, remembering that these two standards really go into the annual report and requires disclosures in the annual report, in the operating and financial review section of the director's report. So it's really a focus on the annual report where we know a separate sustainability report dealing with a lot of other sustainability topics is still okay, it's still on the cards, but I think over time more of more of that information in the separate sustainability report will migrate over to the annual report as we see IFRS S3, S4, et cetera. Um, so Monday was a really big day, we got the standards. Um, and then on the very next day, Australian government um, and Treasury came out with their second consultation paper. Now, this was a big um, step uh, because in December, the first consultation paper talked about how we will have mandatory sustainability reporting in Australia. When will IFRS S1, S2 become mandatory in Australia? And initially, the thinking was a real focus on listed entities. Listed entities, financial institutions, and there was some talk, do we start with large listed, then smaller listed, but absolutely a focus on listed entities, a certain type of entity. Now, this second consultation paper, six months later, after the initial one, after there were a lot of um, submissions um, um, lodged with Treasury, actually changes quite a bit. Um, and it's, 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 it's a big change and therefore also important, but it's interesting that they've waited for the final IFRS S1, S2 to be published and a day later, they give us indication of in Australia, when will it become mandatory? Um, IFRS S1, S2 recommended globally that jurisdictions consider implementing it for years beginning on or after 1 January 24, um, but what are we gonna do in Australia? So what they've said in this consultation paper, and uh, Dylan and I have looked at this um, and it quite extensively, and it, it seems to be close to where the final position will be. Submissions were due um, last Friday. Um, they're breaking mandatory um, reporting into three groups, or the entities that will have to do mandatory reporting into three groups. And the biggest change is that they've moved away from a focus on listed entities and instead are looking at the size of an entity. So whether you are private, family owned or listed, if you're above a certain size, mandatory reporting for you, a big change. For public sector, they've indicated that the Minister of Finance is still looking at that. 
for not for profits again if not for profits are logic with the icnc that is a matter for the icnc to discuss some not for profits still lodge with asic and therefore these rules will apply to them so mainly it is about private sector in australia for profit private sector in australia and it's about size of an entity so the first group that will have to do mandatory reporting of the climate related disclosures initially um, in 24 25 which means 31 december 24 or 30 june 25 if that's your year end if you meet two of the following three thresholds mandatory reporting you have over 500 employees consolidated gross assets of more than a billion and consolidated revenue of more than 500 million and entities required to report and that are under chapter 2m of the corpse act that are a controlling corporation under the inga act and that's where dylan's got a lot of experience and they meet that inga publication threshold so this first group really really, really big there's no reference to whether you're a private company listed company financial institution it's purely about size um, so that's the first group um, for this group dylan and i would say this has come as good news for a lot of small listed entities because they've got more time to get ready but it's come as a shock for a number of large private businesses um, family-owned businesses that are of this size um, because you know they thought this is down the track for them and now we're talking about within 18 months um, so this is a, a big shock um, the second group which has to do mandatory reporting two years later so that will be 31 december 26 or 30 june 27 um, the middle group more than 250 employees gross assets more than 500 million uh, consolidated revenue more, revenue more than 200 million or it's a controlling corporation under the Inga Act. Um, so again, if you meet two of the three, um, you will be captured. And then finally, the last group uh, for mandatory reporting 31 December 27 or 30 June 28 would be all the entities that are currently required to prepare and lodge audited general purpose financial statements with ASIC. Um, so for them, there's a a little bit of a way to go so some listed entities that might fall in this threshold smaller listed entities have a few more years to get ready um so this is really important um you know to make sure you know when this will become mandatory for you in your financial statement so if you're a group one entity that really large entity and you've got a 30 june year end you have to do mandatory reporting 30 june 25 and that will include a disclosure of scope one, scope two. So what we're talking here about setting your carbon footprint and setting boundaries and measuring scope one and two, very relevant for you. And then a year later, you'll also have to include scope three. Um, but if that is your deadline that you're working towards, uh, from one July next year, you have to start to capture all the relevant information which is a bit different to normal financial information so it's really important to start to understand what do i need to do um, in order to start to capture the right information uh, within 11 months um, so real a call to action maybe i should do two more things um, that's important out of the consultation paper and that is that um, treasury indicated that there's an expectation and that's what they'll mandate that auditors of financial financial statement auditors um, will be required to provide limited assurance and later on full audit over this information um, so who will be auditing this information financial statement auditors because they understand auditing standards assurance standards and <coughs> all the techniques required um, and and also that there's an expectation that they'll work with sustainability experts like dylan and i as part of their audit but ultimate sign off auditors and the third thing is that um, because scope three there's a lot of judgment estimation uncertainty because we've got some forward-looking statements around climate scenarios and um, for directors if they act in good faith and honestly there's a three-year period starting next year um, that they won't be necessary they'll be protected 
um, from um, litigation. ASIC can still um, look, uh, you know, question what's going on around reporting, um, but from a liability perspective, there's a three-year period um, that directors are protected. Um, so that's another significant recommendation or proposal. Having said all of that around the Treasury consultation paper, I think we should bring it back to what you're currently looking at, 30 June 2023 reporting or potentially 30 June 24 reporting. Um, so we're looking at the years before we've got this mandatory reporting under IFRS S2. So we're starting with IFRS S2 and the year later IFRS S1. Also in the first year of IFRS S2, it's only scope one and scope two and a year later scope three. So there's a lot of transitional relief. Um, but let's bring it back to this year or even 30 June 24. I think this still holds. There's two things to start with. If you're asking where do I start, I would say two things. One, start with the TCFD recommendations because the TCFD recommendations is the foundation of IFRS S2. So if you can start with TCFD recommendations, um, addressing some of those recommendations in your annual report this year and next year, doing a gap analysis, it will take you a long way to get ready for IFRS S2. It won't take you all the way, but it's a good stepping stone. The other thing is a critical part, a time-consuming part that will be required by IFRS S2 is measuring your carbon footprint. And that's why we've got this webinar series. So I would start with those two. It's, it's a good start. It's not everything, but it's a good start. Now, again, on the TCFD recommendations, we've got online training that can help you to make sense of what it is. Um, the other thing is we've previously launched a TCFD checklist that you can download that can help you with a gap analysis. Um, so if we can address the, the TCFD recommendations, it will prepare us, but also we know ASIC currently strongly encourages, nearly mandates that we comply with the TCFD recommendations. Um, and then to address the other part, and that is the um, greenhouse um, gas uh, protocol, we've scheduled these webinars, which you've registered for, which is a good start again. So that's really the two things to focus on. Um, at this stage, uh, measuring your carbon footprint, Dylan, I think this is where I hand over to you for sure. your expertise uh, to get us started on the real greenhouse gas protocol. Thank you. Thanks, Elena. Um, so some really good information there and I just once again really encourage you to go back to our website because uh, as you'll see as we go through this process today, there's a lot of information out there and what we've done for you is to, I guess, distill that down into a format that you're really getting the key information and will make it a lot easier for you to then go into the, you know, the detailed process that flows from that. Thanks, Elena. So I guess um, a critical thing here is that the greenhouse gas protocol is the constant and a bit like with the, the new sustainability standards coming out, we haven't had a lot of constants in this area. As you can see, there's numerous standards and there's numerous frameworks. I think there's more than 600. Um, so for an entity or an organisation entering this process, it can be a little bit overwhelming as to what standard or what framework do I operate within. It's very reassuring and great to have this GHG protocol underpinning it. All these standards talk to that, that protocol and say, that's the source of truth. That's the rules that we want you to follow. And if you follow those rules, then it will dovetail into whatever framework that we're operating in. So it's very important to have that, that, um, that firm footing to work off. Thanks, Slider. And then if you go into the protocol, we've got the the basic standard, which uh, is, is all the background and how it works and whatnot, but where we want to focus um, through this process is the guidance papers, which is helping you to work through how to look at scope two, and we'll look at that in a minute, but scope three is going to be the big one. And even though that isn't in the first year of reporting under the new standards, um, 
it's it's going to be very important and it's probably the one where there's the most complexity uh, and the other element to to bring to your attention is that if if you're a business and even if you're nowhere near some of those thresholds that we spoke about earlier uh, your scope one and two is going to be someone else's scope three who's you know one of your big customers and at some point in the future when they come and asking you you know what's your scope one and scope two and and to an extent scope three um, that's going to be where you're going to need to have knowledge and have done some of this work already so it's not a uh, for tomorrow type of thing it, it, it really is coming sooner than we think um, this is the 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 overview that I was talking about earlier um, I literally have it open on my on my um, web browser all the time um, I refer to it because uh, as we go through carbon footprinting work and, and carbon audits, uh, it's amazing how often you'll see some of this protocol coming in. Um, we do a lot of audits under the Climate Active Standard, which is a voluntary scheme that a lot of businesses and organisations are in. And so many of these GHG protocol guidelines are inherent in these uh, other schemes. So yeah, if you're into this area and uh, you need to work through it, then I'd say have this open or have it handy because you'll, re you'll be relying on a lot. Yeah, and Dylan, what I like about the publication, it's actually prepared by BDO Global. It's really short. It's, it's small print, I might add, but it's a, it's a short publication that nicely puts it on a few pages. It's really easy to use. You're not, you know, working through hundreds of pages. Cool. And then if you need more, you can look for more. So I, I agree with That's you. Right. I also find it very handy. Yes. Next slide, thank um, So, um, through this process, a letter is going to be talking about uh, the accounting and reporting principles, and then I'm going to follow that up with more of a focus on on how to calculate those uh, footprints. Over to you, Alana. Thank you, Dylan. Um, so interesting, you know, for me coming from an IFRS and a reporting background, um, I all, you know, you use that kind of baggage, I would say, when you look at a new set of rules and and evaluate the rules. Um, so the interesting thing is when you look at the greenhouse gas protocol, and as you read through it, there's often a reference to financial reporting standards or accounting standards, um, which I found really interesting. So what I've done as I read the protocol, every time I see that, I highlight it to say, Elena, this is a reminder that this is very similar. We use similar principles um, and, and similar principles underpin both, uh, which is really interesting. Um, so I'll give you a bit of an overview on, on, on some of the, uh, the similarities and the things that will ring true to you. Um, if we talk about GHG, we talk about generally accepted greenhouse gas GHG accounting principles. And they say these principles and the whole protocol start with these principles. These principles are intended to underpin and guide your greenhouse gas accounting and reporting. Why? Because we want to ensure that the information finally that we report represents a faithful, true and fair account of the company's GHG emissions. And if you think about accounting, we always talk about true and faithful representation of the numbers as well and the transactions. So it's a very similar thing. It has to be faithful, true and fair. Um, and with accounting standards, we refer to generally accepted accounting principles. And here we talk about, you know, the general principles around greenhouse gas accounting and reporting. So that's a good starting point. We're trying to achieve the first, the same thing. If you talk about these generally accepted greenhouse gas accounting principles, again, very similar to what we have in accounting, they talk about relevance, completeness, consistency, transparency and accuracy. So whenever we get a question, um, you fall back on these principles. So if the greenhouse gas pr um, protocol have detailed rules, you would apply that. If there's no detailed rule, you fall back on these principles and say, am I providing relevant, complete, consistent, transparent and accurate information? Right. So that's the underpinning part of the protocol. Um, so if you look at relevance, I thought it was important to unpack this a little bit. Um, if you talk about relevance, it is ensuring that the product, that the, the greenhouse gas inventory 
appropriately reflects the greenhouse gas emissions of the company. So it has to be relevant to the company. Um, it has to serve decision-making needs of the users, internal and external, because if it's relevant, then decision-makers will care about it and will influence their decisions. We do not want to prepare information or include items in the greenhouse gas inventory if it's not relevant to the organization and decision-making, similar to accounting. Um, and, in, and a very important aspect of relevance it's the selection of an appropriate inventory boundary. So an inventory boundary is saying, what are all the greenhouse gas items that should be included in our calculation? So what is within scope and what is outside of scope? So inventory boundary is a different way of saying in scope or out of scope. So that boundary is critically important. It is actually the very first step on the journey, and that's why we start with it today. Um, and, and that inventory boundary, or what is within scope of our calculation, should reflect substance and economic reality of the company's business relationship, and not merely legal form. Now, in accounting, we often talk about substance over form. Um, so you can draft a lot of agreements, but ultimately we want to look at the substance and economic reality um, where lawyers look at the legal form, we look at substance over form. And that is a principle that's also critical um, for greenhouse gas accounting and it's part of relevance, um, which I found really interesting, Dylan, as we went as I went through all of this. Um, the second one, which I think is the one that is often most problematic and we spend most time on, is completeness. Um, and really completeness says we have to account for and we have to report all the greenhouse gas emissions from all the sources and the activities within scope or within our inventory boundary. Um, we have to disclose and justify if there's specific exclusions. Now, there could be a lot of reasons why we've got specific exclusions, um, especially in initial years. It might be we don't have information available. Maybe, um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a continuous improvement journey, right? So there might be a reason why certain things are excluded initially um, and in future years, hopefully we'll include it. But justify why it's excluded in a particular year and disclose it. Um, so we, 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 it's, it's a fair reflection of what we've done. Also, often there's a little bit of judgment or a lot of judgment, I should say, on what is within boundary, what is out of boundary, what is within scope or what is out of scope. And if you make those judgment calls, disclose it. Say, this is how we've applied our judgment. This is why we've decided it's within the inventory boundary, or this is why we've decided it's outside the inventory boundary, because now your users understand whether it's in or out, and they understand why it's in or out. Um, again, very similar to what we do in accounting when we disclose accounting policies and significant judgments. If we think about this practically, and I've seen this practically with a number of clients, um, we want to try and get to a, a position that we are including all the relevant information. So we don't want to exclude things that should be included, right? So that's usually what people worry about around completeness. Do we have everything? We shouldn't exclude things, um, you know, that should be included. But I think the second bullet point there is, is the opposite of that. We also don't want to have double counting. And therefore, we have to be very clear what the organizational boundary is. But when Dylan talks about um, uh, uh, you, you know, the operational boundaries, that's where we have a bigger risk of potentially double counting. So yes, we don't want to exclude anything. We want to make sure it's complete, but we also don't want to double count. And then the other thing that I think practically is, is often an interesting point in this, is the concept of materiality. Now, we also have materiality when we do greenhouse gas accounting and reporting. However, people often say, oh, this is not material. You know, we, we ask questions and we look for information. Oh, why do you worry? This is not material. Now, similar to accounting again, 
you can only assess that something is not material if you first quantify it. So you actually have to calculate the item and then conclude based on this calculation, it's not material. Right, we can't just say it's not material. And we also have to remember, if we've got a thousand items that are individually not material, you know, collectively in aggregate, it could be material. So just be a little bit careful on the concept of materiality. And we'll revisit that in future webinars. But I thought when we talk of completeness, maybe from a practical perspective, just be careful about these three items. Um, consistency. So we want to make sure that we use consistent methodology so we can get meaningful comparisons of emissions over time. Um, the other thing around consistent methodologies for me is also um, if we look at our reporting entities that are included in consolidated financial statements, I also um, would be looking for consistency around which entities would be included in the calculation of our carbon footprint. Um, because the, 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 the protocol says it should be similar. And if it's if it's different, let's disclose why it's different. Um, you know, but we're looking for consistency. If we compare information in financial statements and we compare it with a carbon footprint, we're looking for some level of consistency, but also we're looking for consistency from year to year. We're looking for consistency from company to company and in particular within an industry. So consistency is really important. And therefore, if we change something, maybe around methodology, maybe we change something around methods, um, important to disclose why it's changing, why it's appropriate to change it. And often we will recast previous numbers to get to comparability again. So consistency is important. Transparency. Um, you know, I'm a big supporter of transparency and accountability. Um, throughout life and transparency is here, I love the word uh, and the concept, it address all relevant issues in a factual and coherent manner based on a clear audit trail. So there's a lot in there. Um, factual and coherent in, in, um, manner, um, obviously factual, we can support it, we're not doing greenwashing and coherent because often we can have a lot of facts but if we don't present it in a coherent manner, can be very confusing. So factual in a coherent manner that it's easy to understand. Um, and the next part there, based on a clear audit trail, um, this is when Dylan and the auditors arrive to do an audit, it's important that they can see what we've done, that they can reconcile the numbers, they can see your process. Um, so there has to be a clear audit trail to what we disclose. And this can be a challenge around a, a lot of this information. Um, an audit trail from an accounting perspective is often easier. We have a trial balance, we've got a general ledger, we've got invoices, we've got supporting documentation. So how do we create, create a clear audit trail for carbon accounting and on all kinds of other sustainability information? Um, that's a challenge. So what systems processes, how do we capture the data? But we have to think about that as we go. Um, you know, something in practice around an audit trial, um, I think it's it's really helpful if we can look at a trial balance from an accounting perspective and we can map items in a trial balance to where those items are picked up in a carbon footprint calculation, especially the P&L items. So, you know, there's scope one, there's scope two, there's scope three, and in scope three, we've got 15 categories. So often to make sure that we've picked up everything that we leave an audit trail, and um, also to address completeness, um, we would look at every item in the trial balance and consider where did we pick it up in carbon accounting? And if we didn't pick it up, what's the reason? You know, is there a valid reason for not picking it up? So for example, if we've purchased property, plant and equipment during the year, that would be purchase goods and services part of scope three. Um, if we've spent money on a lot of goods and services, that is purchase goods and services, et cetera. If we've got travel expenses, that will be part of the travel category in, in scope three. Um, so that audit trail and, and kind of ensuring that we're not double counting or missing something, it's a critical part of, of transparency as well. 
And again, the need to disclose relevant assumptions, especially scope three, um, there's a lot of estimation um, and there's a lot of assumptions we have to make. And I'll give you an example. If we have to work out the carbon footprint around uh, working from home, we have to make assumptions often around how many of our staff members are working from home, assumptions on, on how regularly they work from home, assumptions on whether they use electricity for heating um, and cooling or whether they use gas. Um, because, you know, it's often really hard to get 100% accurate information around that. So we need to make assumptions. So we have to disclose those assumptions um, to give some comfort to the users uh, that it's reasonable assumptions. Um, and also we have to, in a transparent, from a transparency perspective, make appropriate references um, to accounting um, and the calculation methodologies we've used and the data sources that we've used. Um, so this all is about communicating what we've done and then accuracy. Again, we wanna quantify our emissions. Uh, it's, it's systematically done um, and you know where we've applied judgment and if there's uncertainties, we've tried to reduce, the, uh, reduce it. Um, and we want to get to an, a sufficient level of accuracy so that the users of this information can make an assessment, can make decisions. Um, so that's really important. So there's five principles here that is underpinning everything we discuss. And with whenever we've, we're in doubt, we will think, does it give transparent information? Is it accurate? Is it complete? Um, is it relevant? Um, so critical principles to consider throughout whatever we do. And the starting point when you do an actual calculation is to determine your inventory boundary to assess what is within scope and what is outside of scope. Um, so we select an appropriate boundary and it should reflect the substance and the economic reality of a company's business and not just the legal form. So your choice of boundary would depend on the characteristics of the company. It would depend on the intended purpose of the information and what users um, needs are. Um, so inventory boundary is really important. Some of the factors you would consider when you choose a boundary, you will look at organizational structures. So you look at control, whether we've got operational control, financial control. We look at ownership structures. We'll actually look at legal structures. We we'll look at whether we've got joint ventures, whether we've got associates. Um, so these organizational structures, um, often that type of information, um, there's organizational diagrams, it's reflected in financial statements, but to get a good understanding of the organizational structure of your entity is really important. How does it all fit together? And then operational boundaries, um, which Dylan will talk about, we look at on-site and off-site activities. Um, you know, so do we have operational control of it or not? We think about processes, services, and impacts. I'm not going to expand too much. Dylan will look at that. And then uh, the business context. Remember, we said substance, commercial reality. What are the nature of the activities? What are the geographic locations? What are the industry sectors? What's the purpose of the information and the uses of the information? Ultimately, whether it's financial reporting or, or, or carbon accounting, we have to focus on the users and their needs, and we communicate to address that. So this inventory boundary, if we narrow it down to physically how do I do it, step one is your organizational boundary, and step two is operational boundary. So let's look at the organizational boundary. So organizational boundaries where you say, let's determine which company operations to include. So let's make it practical. Which subsidiaries, which joint ventures, which associates, which branches. Um, so which of those company operations are within this boundary? And then as a check, I always compare that assessment with what we've done in the consolidated financial statements. And if there's differences, is it an acceptable difference? Is there a reason for the difference? When we look at operational boundaries, uh, again, Dylan will discuss in greater deal, it's which emission sources 
should be included. So we know which entities, but now it's about the sources. And sources, we mean SCUB 1, 2, uh, um, sorry, uh, the categories of SCUB 1, 2, 3, et cetera. So which sources should be included and how do we categorize them across the three scopes? So to set that organizational boundary, um, I, th I thought I'll, I'll, I'll maybe just clarify. Sometimes in the greenhouse gas protocol, they talk about an organizational boundary and other times they talk about a consolidation approach. It's the same thing. The organizational boundary is indicative of which entities you will consolidate in your final carbon accounting number. Um, so sometimes we say organizational boundary, which entities are consolidated. Sometimes it's consolidation approach. So don't get confused by that. We're still talking about the same thing. Um, if you set that organizational boundary, an entity selects an approach for consolidating the greenhouse gas emissions. So there's some, some aspect of selection, and I'll give you the alternatives, um, but it's not a free for all. You will select it based on what would make sense for the substance of the organization and what would provide relevant, complete, transparent information to users, because it's still all about users. Um, and then once we've selected an approach based on what we think is the best way to communicate and reflect economic reality, we consistently apply that approach to, define, uh, to those business and operations that is part of that inventory boundary. And I've said there, the tip is to consider the relevant reporting principles. It's actually stated in the greenhouse gas protocol, consider the relevant reporting principles when you look at the consolidation approach and when you look at the organizational boundary and the relevant accounting standard, it's a fairly new one, IFRS S10, which talks about control. And we've got standards around joint control, significant influence, normal investments, et cetera. Um, so when you set that organizational um, boundary, you might ask, why is it important? Why do we start here, stop here, spend so much time on it? Because a number of our clients, and, and Dylan would support this, our clients have complex business structures, whether it's listed or private or family businesses around subsidiaries, branches, trusts, et cetera. So it's a complex structure. And how do we determine which of those entities in the structure should be part of the carbon footprint? And then it's important to measure um, your emissions consistently throughout the entity. Um, so it's important to know what's in and what's out. Um, and the effect of the choices you make is based on those choices, you would look at um, the emissions. So if you assess, um, if you make different choices and you follow different approaches, it will give you to different emissions. So it has to ultimately be what is transparent, complete and useful for the users. Um, so it is possible that two identical entities could have different emissions if they select different approaches. So we have to remember that. Um, and remember, we want comparable information. Um, if you look at your consolidation approach or selecting this organizational boundary, you're trying to figure out how do we combine the emissions data from all the different entities. Um, so that consolidation approach, there's two approaches in the greenhouse gas protocol. You could either focus on control or you could look at the equity share. Um, so control, there's two ways to assess it. You could say, I would like to focus on control and absolutely be focused on financial control. So if I've got financial control, um, I control it, it should be included um, in our emissions calculation or I want to look at operational control, which could be different to financial control. And if we've got operational control, then we'll assess that we've got control and included in our emissions. So it's not only I'm looking at control, which type of control are you going to focus on and would make sense in the situation. And um, financial control would be very aligned to what we do in accounting. But operational control is also an acceptable method if that we think that is what gives us the, the better transparent information. Equity share 
is where we only include our part um, of the various entities. Um, so with an equity share approach, if we have a 40% interest in an entity, we will include 40% of the emissions of that entity. Control is different. Um, if you say, yes, we control, whether it's financial control or operate, operational control, if you control, it's all in. You control emissions, you bring in all the emissions, 100%. If you don't control, you bring in nothing because you can't influence that or you, you can't make the decision. With equity share, you bring in your relative percentage. So it's somewhat of a different approach. Um, this is a bit of a summary. I, I wanted to bring it together. So if you look at control, that's a control approach. Remember, there's one or two ways to assess whether you've got control. Is it financial control or operational control? Um, if you look at financial control, this is where you direct financial policies to gain economic benefits. Uh, if you have financial control, you bring in absolutely everything, if not nothing. If it's joint control, you bring in your percentage. Operational control is a yes, no assessment. A joint control is, is something that relates to financial control. Um, if we talk about operational control, you either have operational control or not. So it's either all in or all out. And then equity share, you look at your percentage ownership and you bring in your percentage when you do carbon accounting um, at a fairly high level. Now, selecting which approach is best for you, whether it's one of the control approaches or equity approach, a number of things to think about. Um, there's no one right or wrong. You look at the commercial reality. You look at uh, your influence over emissions. You look at regulatory requirements or program requirements. You look at your liability and risk management. You look at financial accounting. One of the things you consider, IFRS 10. You look at management information and performance, um, administrative cost and data access. Um, you look at completeness of reporting. You remember those principles and you say, what would be, um, you know, what approach um, would achieve the principles underlying carbon accounting? Um, so organizational boundaries and double accounting. Um, you apply whatever approach you've got across the entire organizational structure. And the other one is not join, but joint owners should coordinate consolidation approaches. Um, so, you know, if we've got joint owners of a business, it will be different. It will be difficult and confusing if they use different approaches. So it's an encouragement to try and coordinate the consolidation approach. I think that's enough about organizational boundary. Uh, Dylan, I'll hand over to you to set the scene on operational boundary. I know we're going to talk about operational boundary for the rest of the webinar series um, around the different scopes, but maybe a bit of an introduction. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and just, uh, I guess, a couple of thoughts before we, we dive into this is obviously, you, you know, you need to do this in the right order and it just makes so much sense to know which entities you're looking at because you may well have some that you don't need to look at and that's you know you don't be doing carbon audits for more entities than you need to but also just to stress that um, you don't want to be doing this for the first time in the first year of your reporting it's pretty short time frames for turning things around at the end of the the, the year that you're in so just to stress, get this up front, have the discussions with your ownership and management teams about which entities in, which entities are out, and then have the discussions with their finance teams about the data that, that, that they're going to need to be collecting. Because as you'll see through this next step of the presentation, we're not just measuring things in dollars, we're measuring things in kilowatt hours or days or, or trips or et cetera, et cetera. So it can become, um, much more efficient to be collecting the data in the right format at the time of processing the data as opposed to 12 months later saying we've got those power bills or we've got these travel diaries or or working from home surveys or those types of things. So um, I'm going to be focusing on the operational boundaries now for a lot of people who have been in the Engers system for all these years 
there'll be some similarities here when we're looking at facilities and what's in and what's not. Um, but the thing that I want to focus more on is uh, what types of emissions that we're looking at. And this is where the greenhouse gas protocol is very important. Um, so what we're going to look at is um, just the emissions that are associated with the operations on that site. Uh, we're going to look at the difference between direct and indirect emissions. And thirdly, we're going to look at the scope of emissions. Thank you. So this chart is a really good just overview of what we're looking at. Um, so we've got those two categories, direct and indirect. And uh, you've heard scope one, scope two, and scope three mentioned over and over again. And, and for those who haven't come across those concepts, it's quite simply scope one is the emissions that are created on the site and is typically through burning fossil fuels. Uh, and or um, quite often it's methane emissions, those types of things, things that are happening physically in the site that we're looking at. Scope two is an indirect emission because we're not actually creating the emission, but it's the, the emissions that are associated with electricity um, or steam or those types of things that are used for energy but are purchased off, off another party. Obviously, if you're creating your own power on your site, it'd be scope one, but if you're buying power or gas off someone else, then it's your scope two. And those two are caught up in the first year of reporting under uh, S2. And then we mentioned scope three, and this is where we're going to spend quite a bit of time because it's the area where all those principles that are applied, particularly around materiality, because you know you could look at your trial balance or your, your profit and loss from top to bottom, you could you know, look at the, the relative do dollar figures and there's going to be a lot of costs in your p and that, that are not material. Uh, it's still important to look at them, but there may be a, an assessment throughout the process to, to leave some of those alone. Um, certainly when we're doing our carbon audit work, we want to know that the organisation has looked at all of those. We're happy to leave some of them as immaterial for the purposes of testing against source data but we want them to have been assessed in the first place. Thank you. Sorry, Aleta, you're on mute, I think. Yes, I'm sorry, Dylan. You know, I've got the barking dog, so I try to go on mute as often <laughs> as I can, and then I always forget, yes. right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, a practical tip maybe at the end, I, I think, before we start with the detail of looking at what is in scope one, what data you need for scope one next month, and then looking at scope two and three, I think it's really important that we have a really good look at understanding the business, um, all the legal entities, all the operations, all the locations of operations, all the facilities to use your words and all the sites, Dylan. You know, it's a really unpacking of how all of this sits together. Um, often a lot of valuable information would be sitting in the financial statements and how we tell the story there, because it will be a similar story, but from a carbon perspective. Um, so that is a good starting point. And then also to compare that inventory boundary, so what is within the scope of the carbon calculation with what is within the boundary of what's in the financial statements. Um, you know, I think get that clarity um, and that will give us a, a good starting point when we start to look for data. The other thing is as we unfold how the whole business fits together, because this is a business-wide exercise, um, I always find it useful to make notes of we, who would be the best contact person at all the locations, all the entities, all the facilities, all the sites because invariably we have to reach out to all of those people to get certain data. And, and I think what Dylan and I have also found is because carbon accounting and sustainability really is somewhat new and it's a continuous improvement journey, a lot of what we have to do is, taking, is to take people on that journey with us. So if we gather this information about how things fit together, who's the best contact person, also explaining on why are we looking for this information? Um, you know, how does it link together? So that education piece is actually really important for people to understand what we're trying to do. I think if people, um, if we start to ask a lot of questions about a lot of 
things and they don't know why we're asking what we want to do with it, it's always harder. So what we often do, Dylan and I, is present training firm-wide and we record it so they can provide it to all staff, say, this is what these people are looking for. This is why they look for the data. This is the good will that will come from it. Uh, and that's why we need your help. Um, so maybe that's the other practical tip. Um, so how we can help, now at BDO, we focus on five key services. Uh, so we look at measuring carbon footprint is a big thing of what Dylan and I do. And then it flows to how can we reduce that carbon footprint, the, the decarbonisation strategy. All of that information ultimately goes into sustainability reporting, whether it's your annual report or your separate sustainability report, um, subject to IFRS S2 or the TCFD recommendations or whatever framework you use in that separate report. And you often need a strategy or a roadmap on how to get to that first report and then also how to improve it on an ongoing basis. And then finally, um, BDO has a large number of auditors that can assist with limited assurance over carbon footprint or sustainability reporting um, and will help you to be audit ready or do an initial assessment. Are you audit ready? Do you have a good enough audit trail? And it will start with limited assurance and build up, build up to reasonable assurance or um, over time. Uh, you can see Dylan and I are both based in Melbourne about a number of partners across Australia that you can contact to um, to help you. Uh, please feel free to reach out to any of us. Uh, we would love to help you. You can subscribe to our insights and uh, sustainability news went out last week. Um, and we also have corporate reporting insights that link the financial and carbon accounting aspects. Um, we've got a lot of education and training. As you know, we've got these ESG webinars every month. We've got the TCFD e-learning and we continue to develop new training as we speak. Um, and you can also go on our website for further information. Um, I would like to say thank you for joining Dylan and I for this webinar today. I hope you found it useful to get you started on what is in and what is out. And then next month we'll focus on scope one. So thank you everybody. Thank you very much, Dylan. Um, and I'm okay. looking forward to present the next webinar with you in August.